Welcome to the Money Love Podcast. I'm your host and money coach, Paige Pritchard. If you're ready to uplevel your results in relationship with money, you're in the right place. Each week, I give you the tools to transform your mindset, manage your emotions, and achieve results with your money you never dreamed were possible. Hi, love. Welcome to episode 10 of the Money Love Podcast. So happy that you're here. And let me just tell you, buckle in for this one, girlfriend, buckle in, okay? When I was writing the script for this podcast, I was just like, ooh, this is going to be a really good one, but this is also going to be one of those episodes that is really going to stretch you, it's going to challenge you, it might make you feel incredibly uncomfortable at some points, you might disagree with some points that I make in this episode, and that's perfectly fine. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm not here to agree with you 100% of the time. I am here to pull you out of money beliefs that are keeping you stuck, that are keeping you constrained, and that are only going to take you so far. And so what we're going to do in this episode is I am going to walk you through five money lies that we are all taught. Now, I want to be clear about this. What makes something true and what makes something a lie is really something that we have to question because what is true? The way that I define it is that what is true for you is what you choose to believe. And the great thing about that is that you can choose to believe whatever you want. But most people don't know that. Most people don't know that they can just believe whatever they want, that your own version of the truth is just what you choose to believe. And so I'm here to tell you that you can believe anything that you want about money. But if that is the reality, if we can believe whatever we want about money, then how about we believe truths about money that serve us? So that's what we're going to be doing in this episode. I'm going to be walking you through five money lies, quote unquote, that more than likely I think you've probably been taught, but I also don't think are serving you very well. This becomes so interesting when we start talking about money. If you listened to the very first episode of the podcast, I walk you through this concept. But what you believe to be true about money are quote unquote truths that you learned more than likely when you were very young. A lot of it came from your parents, either directly by what they told you or what you observed from them. But the reason that this becomes so murky is because that while your parents or other people in your life or other inputs in your life were teaching you all these things about money, it was also a time in your life when you were learning a lot of actual facts about the world. You were learning that one plus one equals two. The sky is blue. That rhymed. I didn't intend for it to, but it did. And then, you know, like, hey, that thing over there that's green and has leaves growing on it, that's called a tree. And there's 26 letters in the alphabet. And here's how the alphabet goes and the order that it goes in. And so you were learning all these quote unquote facts alongside picking up on a lot of things that are really just people's beliefs and opinions of how they think that the world works, especially when it comes to money. So when your parents would tell you money is the root of all evil or money doesn't grow on trees. And then they would tell you like, hey, just work really, really hard and you'll be set financially. Your young, undeveloped brain at that point in time couldn't yet decipher between fact, like one plus one equals two, and someone's belief, like money is the root of all evil. And so when you're young, you're just like, okay, got it. Money doesn't grow on trees. Just work really hard. Got it. Check, check, check. And your mind just starts to believe that this is the truth. These are the facts about how money works. And so the first step in this process is just recognizing the fact that a lot of things that you were taught when you were a kid, especially about money, is simply just someone else's view of the world, what they have chosen to believe about money, and they are simply just passing on that belief to you. And when you and I work together one-on-one, we spend a lot of time questioning everything that you've been taught about money. And so often it's identity shattering because imagine if someone told you like, well, you know that like one plus one thing, that's not really the case. You'd be like, what? What do you mean? I've always used that in my life. It's always something that I've believed. And then I'm over here like, well, I know that that's what you were taught, but here's another way of looking at the world. Here's another way of looking at money. And it's just kind of like your brain explodes there for a second. And so what I always like to say is just question everything. What you think is a fact of the world may just be a belief 
that someone taught you to believe that isn't actually serving you. Now, there are things that we are taught about money that are facts, right? Okay, I'm not saying everything that you've been taught isn't true, like how to count money. Like, okay, this is a $5 bill, and it's the same thing as having five $1 bills, and this is how much things cost, and this is kind of the exchange of money. There are things that you're taught about money that are facts. So again, I'm not saying everything, but I am saying a lot of what you've been taught isn't actually the way that money works in the world. And so what we're going to do in this episode is we're going to dive into five of the very most common money lies that I can almost guarantee were put in your head at some point along the way. Maybe not all five of these, but I would say at least one of these you can look at and say, yep, for sure. I was definitely raised to think that that's the way that money works. Now, this episode, I want to make this disclaimer. I want you to look at this like a buffet. Take and adopt what you like, what resonates with you what you think is going to serve you better moving forward than the current belief that you have, and you can just leave behind anything that you think that won't and that doesn't resonate with you. But remember, if we want to change our results with money, we have to change our thinking. Plato said, reality is changed by the mind. We change our reality by changing our mind. And this episode is going to help you start changing your money reality. Your thoughts and beliefs determine the quality of your life. So your thoughts and beliefs about money are going to determine the quality of your financial life. All right, so let's jump in. The first lie, the first one, is that money is moral. Wow, this is a big one, which is why I put it first. I think that this one probably isn't one that your parents sat you down and ever outwardly verbalized to you. But you probably picked up on this one through observations from them, from other people, from the media, from teachers that you've had, from your religion, from your education. This one means that money and the amount of it that you have means something about your morality and about your character. So this would be all the thoughts that you have about rich people, all the thoughts that you have about poor people, how you think about the amount of money that you have and how it reflects upon your worth as a human being, what your debt says about you, all of those things. So many people that I work with will say things like, I feel guilty for having this money. I'm so embarrassed and I'm so ashamed by all the debt that I have. If I want a lot of money, that means that I'm going to be materialistic. Money is the root of all evil. These are all examples of you attaching money and morality. That is the first lie that you've chosen to believe, that money and the amount of it that you have changes who you are, and it alters your character. And this is a really sticky one because it really, when you think about it, it's a double-edged sword. Because having a lot of money makes you evil and greedy and materialistic and a bad person. So then we default to not having a lot of it, which then makes us feel embarrassed, ashamed, incapable, dependent on somebody else. So it's like, we can't have a lot of it but we can't not have it either. When you attach money and morality, it is a lose-lose situation because all of the things that you make it mean. One of the most powerful questions that I always like to use in any situation where I'm really trying to work through, process something, and coach myself is I always like to ask the question, what am I making this mean? What am I making it mean about me? What am I making it mean about other people? And so I want you to ask yourself that question. Use that question to uncover what it is that you are making money mean. And here's the truth. If you're making it mean anything about you, you're making it moral. And it's not. Because the truth is, is that money isn't moral. It's neutral. Like I always say, money just is. And when you're doing a model, your CTFAR, every single time money goes in the C line, in the circumstance line, which means that it's neutral. And it has no meaning until our human brains come in and assign it meaning. Here's the amazing part about knowing that money is neutral and that it doesn't mean anything about you. When you know this and you believe this, then at that point, you can always approach your money with love, with gratitude, with appreciation, instead of approaching it with guilt, shame, and resentment. If all of you listening to this believed that money was neutral, You would not be beating yourselves up or torturing yourselves about your student loans, about your debt. You would just be like, let's get these suckers paid off. I know that I can because I know that I'm amazing. And these are just numbers on a statement. 
and they don't say anything about me. I don't have to shame myself. I don't have to think I'm a terrible person. Let's just lock in and get these suckers paid off. You can also go out and make all the money that you've been destined to make because like we talked about in the last episode, you can go out and make tons of money without pushing it away or without sabotaging yourself because again, you'd be like, let's just go out and make a crap ton of money because I want to and because it's fun and why not? So that I can go out and live my version of a rich life and also go out and do a ton of good in the world. So many women don't do this because they think that wanting a lot of money or going out and making and having a lot of money changes who they are, and it starts to mean all these terrible things about them. And I tell you this a lot, like my mission is to help you reach your full financial potential. And as long as you continue to believe that money is moral, it is going to be so hard and a lot more painful of a process for you to reach that full potential. Remind yourself, money just is, and I get to decide what I'm going to make it represent, what I'm going to make it mean about me, and what I'm going to make it mean about other people. And so if I can control that, if I'm in the driver's seat, why not make it mean something amazing and productive to my future success in building my version of a rich life? All right, that's number one. Number two, the second lie, is that money comes from time and effort. So if you listen to episode two of the podcast, you can really get a deep dive on this topic. That is essentially what the entire episode is about. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this one, but this is another common one that maybe was just flat out communicated to you. And I bet that a lot of you saw this play out in your households growing up. I did, certainly. So let me tell you, my parents bless them, two of the best people in the world. As a little kid growing up, I saw both of them work so incredibly hard. And I think that for many of us, that's also what you saw your parents do. Because in our parents' generation, there were entrepreneurs and people going out and starting their own businesses, sure, but not like today, because the world looked so different back then. There was no internet, there were no smartphones, there was no social media, there were no podcasts, there was no remote working or working from home. The world just looked so different. And so what most people did back then is they got up and they went to work every day. And most of them waited every year for their 2% raise and they just stuck it out at the same company for 30 years until they could get their pension and retire. And that was just the path. That's just what you did. And it was the same for our grandparents' generation as well. And so in order to stay moving down that path, you just needed to show up every day and work really hard and quote unquote, put in your time to get your raise and to get to your retirement. And that is the narrative that got passed down to our parents from their parents. And then it got passed down to us as well. This narrative of just work really hard and exchange your time and the rest is going to take care of itself when it comes to your money. So I'm not going to harp on this one too much. Again, just go listen to episode two. But the basic premise is this. Time doesn't create money. Effort doesn't create money. Value creates money. And the incredible thing about value is that one, it comes from your mind. So it's something that you have power over since it comes from within you. And two, the amount of value that you can put out into the world is unlimited unlike your time and your effort. Money is made by how we think, by our human ingenuity and the value that we add. Value makes money. Now, hard work and time does produce value, but it's not the hard work and the time that's creating the money. It's the value that you've created with the hard work that's making the money. So the lie is that time creates money, that hard work and effort creates money. But the truth is that value creates money and money buys you back more time. This is a shift again that is going to take you out of a limiting construct and open you up to a limitless potential when it comes to your money, which is my main goal for you. Okay, that's number two. Let's move on to number three. Number three is the lie that money is a finite resource. For most of us, I don't think this is one that was very obvious to us. I think this one was a lot more subconscious. I don't ever remember being outwardly told this by anyone. Maybe you did, but I didn't. 
I feel like it's something that we just kind of pick up on by the way that we observe our parents act and talk about money and other people as well. I don't want to be putting this all on our parents. There are other inputs as well, but your parents are such a huge input into what you chose to believe or the people who raised you are such a huge input into what you choose to believe. Whatever that influence was for you in your life, you might have heard them say things like, who has that kind of money? Or we don't have that kind of money. Or we can't afford that. Or money doesn't grow on trees, right? So all of those messages, again, send to your very young brain that money is limited, it's scarce, it's hard to come by, and that there's not enough of it. And so what happens is we start to think of money in terms of a limited pie, in terms of a finite resource that there's only so much of. And whenever you start to think that there's only so much of something, then that means that more for me means less for somebody else, and vice versa, more for somebody else means less for me. And I think that subconsciously, this is such a big reason why we have so many issues today with money comparison and why it hits us so hard and why it's so difficult for us to process because underneath it all, we truly believe that other people are building wealth at our expense. By them increasing the amount of money that they have, they are detracting away from what's possible for me. I want to give you an analogy that I heard from Brooke Castillo on her podcast. She is one of my role models and my money mentors that I love learning from so much. And when she gave me this analogy, I thought it was so helpful to reframe this part of my money belief. And I'm going to share it with you. When you think about how much money is out there and available to you in the world, I want you to think of the ocean, the huge, vast, deep, ocean. Think about money in that way as well. Vast, open, abundant, always replenishing itself. So if you were to go out on a boat with a group of people into the ocean and you were each given like a pile of buckets, a stack of buckets, and just told, we're going to give you as many buckets as you want and as many buckets as you can scoop out of the ocean into this boat, you'll have a bucket for. So go ahead and start scooping the water out of the ocean and into the boat, and you can just keep whatever you can scoop out of the ocean. In that scenario, I guarantee you, you would not be concerned about there being enough water to go around for the group of people on that boat to scoop out what they wanted to scoop out. Because it's the freaking ocean. It's huge. You wouldn't even be looking over at what other people are scooping out and being like, oh my gosh, all the water they're scooping out means less for me. You would just be like, heck yes, there is so much water out here, plenty to go around for all of us. So much so that there's no way that even just us on this boat will even be able to scratch the surface of what's available to us to take. Because again, this is the ocean. Money is the same way. You're sitting there in scarcity, buying into the lie that there's only so much to go around, that someone else having success financially takes away from your potential to achieve your own version of financial success. But when you can shift to the truth that money is an abundant resource and actually does, quite literally, grow on trees, (laughs) they just keep making more of it. Then instead of falling into the comparison trap and having resentment towards others, we can all just start to cheer each other on and clap for one another when we see another woman out there killing it financially because you know that her having success does not detract away from your potential in any way. So that's number three, the lie that money is finite. It is not. Money is abundant and there is plenty to go around. The fourth lie is that money makes you feel a certain way. Fill in the blank for you. Money makes me feel happy, makes me feel secure, makes me feel worthy, makes me feel accomplished, makes me feel important. And I'm actually going to take this one up like 30,000 feet in the air and let's go a little higher than just money on this one because this lie extends far past our money. We could go as broad to say that we've all bought into the lie that external circumstances cause us to feel a certain way, that other people make us feel a certain way, that our relationships make us feel a certain way. This idea is rampant. It is pounded into your head from a very young age, mine included. 
Growing up, I guarantee you that you were told over and over and over, well, what you did hurt my feelings. What you said hurt mommy's feelings. Oh, did your little friend at school hurt your feelings? Young kids are taught at a very young age that their feelings can get hurt by other people instead of teaching them that our feelings are actually caused by our own mind. What this teaches us is that the way to not get hurt is to control other people, to control what they think about us, to control what they say about us, to control what they do to us. So we turn ourselves into actors, into a fake curated version of ourselves, where we try to please other people so that they won't hurt our feelings, so that we won't hurt their feelings. And that's why so many of us feel like we don't even know who we are, because we are so focused on what other people think about us, and we're also so focused on what they're going to think about what we do. Because again, we've bought into the lie that they can hurt our feelings and we can hurt their feelings. This could truly be the most disempowering lie that we're taught. Another person or an external circumstance cannot make you feel anything and vice versa. You cannot cause a feeling within anybody else. It's the same thing with money. I've said this before, but let me say it again until I'm blue in the face. Money doesn't make you feel anything. Your thoughts about money are what create your feelings about money. So I'm going to give you this example, and I think that this will kind of really help you see that this clearly is the way that it works. Bernie Madoff. If you are not aware of this situation, let me just give you a short snippet of what happened. Bernie Madoff was a very prominent Wall Street figure. He was a former chairman of the NASDAQ. He founded a major like securities and investment firm that many very wealthy people had their money invested through. And then in 2008, over 10 years ago, it was revealed that basically his company was just a giant Ponzi scheme. I want to say it was the largest or biggest, I could be wrong about this, but a very major case of stock and securities fraud to the tune of $65 billion. Now, this was an incredibly unfortunate situation. A lot of people lost a lot of money through this. A lot of people lost their entire life savings. And it's just really, honestly, very sad and unfortunate when you think about this. But if we take a second and we just evaluate the people who lost their money, those people went years feeling very wealthy and feeling very secure with the belief that they had a lot of money. But the reality was is that the money wasn't there. The money was gone. It was all a farce. There was no money. But those people believed with their thoughts that the money was there, so they felt secure. Now, once they found out that, in fact, there was no money, then, of course, after learning that, they started to have a completely different set of thoughts about the money not being there. But if it was, in fact, true that the money itself made them feel a certain way, then as soon as the money was quite literally gone then their feelings would have changed. But that's not how it works. It's when you change your viewpoint via new information and your thoughts and your mindset changes that your feelings start to change. You go from feeling secure to exposed. Not from the money not being there, but from the thought that it's not there. Because those people in reality, those people went a long time, actually with no money at all, but yet they still felt wealthy and secure through their thinking that it was there. Okay, it's the same thing when people pass away. It's not the person passing away that makes you sad. It's the thoughts that you have about the person passing away that makes you sad. Someone could pass away and you don't find out about it until you know a day later, let's say. And it's not until you find out about it that you start thinking your thoughts about them passing away and then you feel sad. It's not like when somebody passes away, the second they die, you immediately start to feel sad. That's not how it works. It's because your thoughts create your feelings, not the circumstance, not the money, not somebody dying. Now, like I said, conceptually, this is a really hard one because this one is deep rooted, deep rooted. It is so much easier. I get it. It is easier to sit there and say that it is the external world that causes our feelings rather than our own brains and that our thoughts cause our feelings. But 
I hope that these two examples kind of just open you up to the fact that it's your thinking that causes your feelings, not the external circumstances of the world. Here's one more thing I want to say about this one. I am not saying that this means that now that you know that your feelings are created by your thinking, that you should not feel sad or insecure or exposed ever. No, of course not. Those are completely normal reactions to situations like this. When somebody dies, we want to be sad. When somebody steals all our money, we want to be upset about that. So I'm not saying to not ever feel negative emotion. It is healthy. Remember, 50-50. I'm just saying have the awareness that the negative emotion is coming from your own mind, never the thing. Because when you know that, then you can process through the emotion with compassion and awareness of where it's coming from instead of being at the mercy of and making yourself a victim to the world, which you cannot control. Okay, so that is number four. And the last one, number five, is that factors outside of you dictate your potential for financial success. So this one ties very nicely into the one that we were just talking about. But this one says that factors in the world outside of you control and have ultimate authority over how successful you can be financially. So where you grew up, who your parents were, the schools you went to, your profession, your personality, your intelligence, that those things all have to line up and be in your favor for you to have success with money. And it's just simply not true. If that were true, then everyone with the same external environments and the same external circumstances would all have identical financial results. And we know that that's just not the way it works. When we know our model, we can see that our results are created with our thinking. Every result that you experience in life can be tied back to a set of actions. And those actions are driven by your emotions. And your emotions are created by your thinking. That's the chain. That's how it works. That's our model. In the book, Failing Forward by John C. Maxwell, he talks about how failure is always an inside job. He starts off one of the chapters of the book with a Danish saying that says, life is not simply holding a good hand. Life is playing a poor hand well. So in the book, he says, at no time in life are people more prone to allow failure to overcome them and to give up when external circumstances cause extreme hardship or grief. But ultimately, no matter whether the difficulty is self-created or comes from somewhere outside of them, failure is created within them. It is always an inside job. No matter what happens to you, the important thing is what happens in you. It's not what happens to me, it's what happens in me. It's not the size of the problem, but how I handle the problem. When I fall, I keep getting up. Many people desire to control the circumstances of their lives, but the truth is, is that we cannot determine what will come our way. We can't control the hands we're dealt, only how we play the cards. I know it's easier to have something or someone to blame as to why you're not getting the results that you want. Our brains do not like the discomfort of being wrong or having to take on that level of personal responsibilities over our lives, it can be very daunting. But as long as you continue to blame the economy, your job, your boss, your spouse, your parents, your upbringing, as to why you're not getting the results that you want, you will continue to be at the mercy of the world. And that is the most powerless place that you can be. When you can accept that your results in life are dependent on you, then you know that your financial success is also up to you, not anything outside of you. So those are the five money lies I have for you today. To sum it up, they were. Lie number one, money is moral. It's not, it's neutral. Lie number two, money comes from time and effort. It doesn't, money comes from value. Lie number three, money is a finite resource. It's not, it's an abundant resource. Lie number four, money makes you feel a certain way. It doesn't. Your brain creates the way that you feel through your thinking and through your beliefs. And lie number five, your financial success is dependent on your external circumstances. It's not. Your results can always be tied back to your thinking, which comes from within you. Okay, that's all I got for you. 
I hope that you enjoyed this episode and that it was helpful for you. If it was, please make sure to take a screenshot or a screen recording of your favorite part of the episode and share it on Instagram. I love you and I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Money Love Podcast. If you're loving the podcast, then I want to invite you to join me in the Overcoming Overspending membership. It's where we take this work deeper and apply the concepts and coaching from each week's episode into your own life. By being a member, you have exclusive access to my Overcoming Overspending process, 10 monthly live coaching calls with me, a private podcast, members only community, monthly money topic and challenge, bonus courses, and so much more. There's nowhere else like it out there to level up your finances and life. Simply go to overcomingoverspending.com to join and you can enter in the code MLP30 at checkout to save $30 on your first month inside the membership. See you inside.